الحمد لله رب العالمين له الحمد الحسن والثناء الجميل وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا ونبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين لهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد إن شاء الله تعالى وإن الشرح of the كتاب uh, سفينة النجاة Last lesson we spoke about mujibat al-ghusl. We spoke about the things that necessitate ghusl. And we mentioned there are six things that necessitate ghusl. Ghusl is a legal Islamic bathing. It's to shower and to cleanse yourself and to clean yourself. And what we said is there, there are six things that necessitate uh, ghusl. Now, inshallah ta'ala, today we're going to go into furudul ghusli. Now we're going to go into the pillars, pillars of ghusl. So the author, rahimahullah, here he says, faslun, section, furudul ghusli thnani, the pillars. Now what I want, inshallah ta'ala, I don't know if I've mentioned this, but I'm going to go through it now, inshallah ta'ala, is the difference between three things that are commonly uh, confused. The three are as follows. So the first one is, shart. That's number one. The second one is uh, wajib, I'm a wujub. And number three is arkan. And these three are important if you're studying fiqh to know the difference between the three. You see, wajib. Under it falls shart and arkan. Yani every shart is wajib and every arkan is wajib. But the arkan and the shart have an additional thing than it just being obligatory, than it just being wajib. Yani shart is wajib wa ziyada. Yani it's obligatory and it is extra. Arkan is obligatory and it's extra. It's important you understand that. Okay, what is the extra thing about it then? The extra thing is if you leave a wajib, you are a sinner and that's it. And by the way, me saying that doesn't mean I'm undermining the concept of it being a sin. That is not what I mean, okay? But what I'm saying is that the shart is not just a sin. In other words, it's a sin and that action itself is null and void. This must be understood. The shart, it takes away from it or the shart makes it uh, null and void. If the p- shart is missing, this action is null and void. And the same applies with the rukun or arkan. If a rukun, a pillar is missing, you're not just sinning by leaving it deliberately, but also this, this action is null and void. Yani, you have to repeat it again. So, Shart is null and void, and rukun is null and void, and both of them are obligatory. The question now is, which is the second question, what is the difference between a shart and a rukun? The difference between a shart and, and an arkan is that shart is a prerequisite to the action, meaning it's before the action uh, occurs, whereas a rukun is part of the action itself. For example, a shart would be wudu. And a rukun would be, for example, qira'at suratul fatiha. 
the reciting of Surah Al-Fatiha. So a wajib is that which you don't have to bring back. Meaning if you miss a wajib in the salah, your salah is not null and void. Okay? And you're not commanded to repeat it. Okay? You're not commanded to repeat it. Whereas a shart, you're, you're requested to redo it again. And a rukun, you're requested, to, you're requested to redo it again. Like in the shart, is before the action of whether it be salah or wudu is before it. And a, a, a rukun is part of it. I hope that is understood, inshallah ta'ala. So the author, rahimahullah, here, what he did was, he said, فُرُوضُ الْغُسْرِ He means arkanul الْغُسْرِ The pillars of ghusl. That's what he means. The author, rahimahullah, he mentions the pillars of ghusl. فُرُوضُ الْغُسْرِ It means arkanul الْغُسْرِ The pillars of ghusl. The arkanul ghusli that the author chose to mention here are two. Yani the pillars that the author mentioned are two here. Whereas the other aima to Shafi'iya, like Al Imam Nawawi and Al Imam Rafi'i and others, they mentioned three. But this book only mentioned two, so we're just going to stick with the two. The first one is Aniyah. Aniyah is a pillar for ghusl. Yani if you want to do ghusl, the first pillar is a niyyah. A niyyah. A niyyah, we said, it's a what? It's a intention. It's intention. We have to mention the evidence for it. The evidence for this is the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, that the Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ وَإِنَّمَا لِكُلِّ مْرِئٍ مَا نَوَى That hadith is the evidence for the intention. And remember, brothers and sisters, as I think I've pointed out, in different places and also in different occasions, I've kind of pointed out this point, which is the intentions, the intention, um, the intention which in Arabic is an niyyah. The niyyah does two things. Okay? The niyyah, the intention, does two things. The first thing that the intention does is it, it, it distinguishes the ibadat from the adat, the norms. Number one, the intention, it distinguishes and separates what you are doing for Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala, what you're doing for the religion and the sake of Allah tabarak wa ta'ala. And the second thing which is what you are doing it for norms. That's the first point, okay? We're at the first point. The intention, what does it benefit? Or the, bene- the intention are done for distinguishing a ibadah from a ada, a norms from an ibadah, an act of worship. And the reason why the author mentioned فُرُوضُ الْغُسْلِ ثْنَانِ النيّتو, is that the intention is needed when you're doing ghusl because ghusl is an act where people, they have a norms of showering. They have a norms of cleaning themselves. Okay? So you need to distinguish that from the act of worship here. I hope this point is understood very well. Ghusl is an act of norms. People love to shower, clean themselves on a regular basis. How do you distinguish that from when you're doing it uh, out of the shar'i ghusl? So that's why intention is required for ghusl. Intention is also required in Salah, for example. But when it's required in the Salah, it isn't required to distinguish between a Salah which is a norms and a Salah which is ibadah. Because there isn't a Salah which is norms. So it falls into the second type which is تَمْيُزُ الْعِبَادَاتِ بَعْضِهَا عَنْ بَعْضِ 
to distinguish one ibadah from another ibadah. So why do you come with an intention for dhuhr? Is because you need to distinguish between dhuhr's intention from the, uh, um, the sunnah after dhuhr or the sunnah before dhuhr or the fajr, sorry, the asr prayer and dhuhr. That's why we come with intention for the salah. I hope that's, in, that's understood inshallah ta'ala. So intention here, you could be asked, why do you have to come with an intention for ghusl? If you were asked like that in a test, you have to say, the reason is because it resembles a'ada al-nums, fatajibu niyatu tamiz So the intention must be brought to distinguish it from what? From the ibadah, or the ada, sorry. And that's what the scholars have pointed out. مَقْصُودُهَا التَّمِيزُ لِلْعِبَادَةِ مِمَّا يَكُونُ شِبْهُهَا فِي الْعَادَةِ كَمَا تُمَيِّزُ بَعْضُهَا مِنْ بَعْضٍ فِي رُتَبٍ كَالْغُسْلِ وَالتَّوَضِّي الْأَهْدَلْ mentions. That's one, that's a point that's understood inshaAllah ta'ala. The second is وَتَعْمِيمُ الْبَدَنِ بِالْمَاءِ The second one is before I go into the second one, the question here is, when you are doing ghusl, when do you come with the intention? When do you what? When do you come with the intention? You come with the intention in the ghusl, awwal juz'in min al-badani. You come with the intention at the beginning of the ibadah. <laughs> in other words, before you wash yourself, before the water goes on the entire body, you come with the intention, they say, the starting when the water starts on the body, that's when you come with it. There's an exception of ghusl that is not uh, required for it intention. Meaning there's one situation in which the fuqaha mentioned where there is no requirement for intention for that particular ghusl. Yani the scholars, they mention one particular uh, ghusl where you don't need intention. And that one they mention is, uh, it's ghusl al when the dead is being washed. The dead being washed, the Shafi'iyah, they mention that the intention is not obligatory, but rather it's recommended. Okay, they say the ghusl is wajib, like in the niya is mandub, is recommended. The ghusl of that body is wajib, but the intention is mandub. The second pillar for um, the second pillar for the ghusl uh, is ta'amimu um, al-badani bil ma'i. The water reaching the entire body. The water must reach the entire body. The person has to make that water come in contact with all of the body. And it has to go in the entirety of the body. That you're not allowed to, you're not allowed to um, have something on your body where the water doesn't reach. So sometimes what happens is, Women, they may have, women, they may have nail polish um, and etc. or other things which does prevent them from the water reaching the body when they are washing it. It has to reach the whole entire body. Look at what the author here said. He said, وَتَعْمِيمُ الْبَدَنِي بِالْمَاءِ That the water reaches the body. The body here means... The outer of the body. And it doesn't mean the inside. So it's not about it going into your nose or it going into your mouth and etc. It means the outer of the body. The hair, the skin, the nails. The, the scholars they mentioned, does it have to go under the nails? Shafi'iyah believe, yes, it has to go under the nails, the armpits, your shoulders, 
your hair, going inside your, the root of your hair. Now, please pay attention here. The ghusl is divided into two. A ghusl which is done from an act that is repetitive. Yani ghusl from a very repetitive action. For example, from janaba. Sexual intercourse, for example. A wife and a husband. The wife has long hair and she plaits her hair. She plaits it. Okay. Does she have to unplait her hair? Does she have to undo it when she's doing ghusl from janaba, sexual intercourse? The strongest is no, she doesn't. If the water goes on it, or even if she wipes over it, it's fine. If it's from sexual intercourse. As for hayd, menstruation, the woman has to undo her hair. Because it's not repetitive. It doesn't come very often. It doesn't come very often. Be point, take that point. Insha'Allah Ta'ala. Now, Insha'Allah Ta'ala, we're going to go into, as for the, sorry, sorry, as for the second condition, which is that the water reaches the whole entire body, what is the evidence for that? The evidence for that is the hadith narrated in Bukhari and Muslim, min hadith Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, from our mother Aisha, that she said, kana idha ghtasala, that the Prophet sallallahu was one that if he done ghusl, min al janabati, if he did ghusl from janaba, bada'a faghasala yadayhi, he will start by washing his hands. Thumma yusibu ala rasi thalatha uraf, then he pour on his hair three times, with his hand. Then he would run the entire water onto his body, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the narration mentions, يُفِيضُ الْمَا عَلَى جَلْدِهِ He will do it on all of his body. So, the narration mentioned all of his body. This shows, تَعْمِيمُ الْبَدَنِ بِالْمَاءِ That the water needs to go on the entirety of the body. That's their evidence. And also, the scholars unanimously agree upon. Unanimously. They all agree that the water must go on the entire body. Al-Imam al-Nawawi in his kitab Al-Majmu' he transmitted the ijma' on that issue. In the second volume, page 181. And he mentioned that this is muttafaqun alayhi bayn al-fuqaha. That this is agreed upon by all the jurists. There is no difference of opinion. Um, so there's no khilaf in this particular issue that the water must reach the whole entire body. Now, inshallah ta'ala, we're going to go into shurudul wudu'i, the prerequisites. Again, we've taken what shart is and the meaning of shart. We've taken what a shart is. Shart is a prerequisite. Something that must be done before the wudu. The author, rahimahullah, here, he mentions ten. There are ten things that a person must do before they do wudu. Amma, there are ten things that must be there before wudu is done. The first thing is al-Islam. The first prerequisite, the condition is al-Islam Islam. فَلَا يَصِحُّ وُضُوءُ الْكَافِرِ The wudu of a kafir is not accepted. If a kafir just comes and he does wudu, it's not accepted. It is not, it is not accepted. Why? Because the uh, wudu 
is a ibadah badaniya, is a physical ibadah. And a condition for the wudu is that a person is a Muslim. The person is a, a Muslim. And there is no Islam. So if he does wudu, his wudu will not be accepted. Because the condition that was there before it is missing. Number two. So what benefit does this issue bring? A man done wudu before he took Islam. So we have a, a man or a woman, they did wudu before they took their shahada. They did wudu. Then they took their shahada. Can they pray? Or do they have to redo their wudu? Okay. According to the view of the Shafi'iyah here is that he has to do wudu. He has to do wudu. Because this wudu was done before he became a Muslim. Okay. The second condition is at tamyizu. Huh? At tamyizu. What does tamiz mean? Tamiz is different from bulugh. The author, here he mentioned at tamizu. Tamiz is different from bulugh. What is the difference? Tamiz is the opposite of a child who cannot tell the difference. Yani, tamiz and bulugh, the difference is Salah is upon the mumayyaz, the child who's mumayyaz, the salah is required from him, is needed from him. Yani the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi as we know in the hadith, he made it a condition or he commanded that the child be told to pray at the age of 10. But the child hasn't reached the age of puberty yet. We say he hasn't reached bulug, but he's a mumayyaz. He's reached tamiz. So if a child who hasn't reached puberty, but he is a mumayyaz, meaning he has reached tamiz, he distinguishes things, he knows the things around him, he understands, he has understanding of things as they are, then his wudu is correct. His wudu is what? His wudu is correct. So remember here, al-islam wa tamiz, tamiz here does not mean puberty. Tamiz here means that the child can distinguish between things. So if he's 10 and he's not reached age of puberty, it doesn't matter. Wudu uh, is uh, accepted from him. So tamiz. Tamiz means idrakul ashiyai ala haqiqatiha. It is to know things in its reality. The third condition, the third prerequisite is وَالنَّقَاءُ عَنِ الْحَيْضِ وَالنِّفَاسِ What does the word النَّقَاءُ mean? النَّقَاءُ means الْخُلُو النَّقَاءُ means الْخُلُو is the absence of الْحَيْضِ nifas, meaning there is no menstruation and there is no postnatal bleeding. حيض is menstruation. And a nifas is the postnatal bleeding. So the third condition, and the word al-naqa'u means al-khulu, that there isn't. Hayd or nifas. Because hayd and nifas are mani shar'i. They are legislative preventatives. They are a legislative preventative. Yani you are prevented shar'an as a woman to pray. So if a woman said, I want to do wudu even, even that though I'm on my menstruation, she's a sinner. She's sinning to doing that. Because the sharia prevented her from this. So, here, the women who are ha'id and the nufasa. The women that are on their menstruation and the women that are on their postnatal bleeding, they are missing a condition for wudu. 
Ibadah is not accepted from them at that moment. Yani the ibadah of wudu is not accepted from them at that moment. Okay. Is wudu accepted from the person who has al bawlu salis? A person has a, a continual urine. He just, he urines too much. He can't hold his urine. Yeah. Yani there's a person who can't hold their urine. And the urine, they're always having urine drops. Urine drops, they can't hold it. This person is permissible. And the women who have istihaba, istihaba, continue bleeding. They are also allowed to do wudu. They are also allowed to do wudu. Number four. Number four is, وَعَمَّا يَمْنَعُوا وُصُولَ الْمَاءِ إِلَى الْبَشَرَةِ the fourth condition is Al-Khulu Again Wa'amma The wow here in the word Wa'amma Is connected to Wa'naqa'u It's connected to Wa'naqa'u The absence Of um, Anything That's preventing the water To reach the body there are things that can prevent a woman for the water to reach her body. That is not there. So number four is the uh, being free from that which prevents the water from reaching the skin. So the wow here is connected to one naqa'u. Meaning you're free from anything that can prevent the water from reaching the body. It, whether that thing is a hard object or whether that is a, a liquid or whatever it may be, anything that prevents the water from reaching the body, there's no wudu here. Number five is, وَأَلَّا يَكُونَ عَلَى الْعُضْوِ مَا يُغَيِّرُ الْمَاءَ The fifth one is, nothing should be upon the limb. So this person, his limb or her limb, there can't be anything on there which will change the quality of the water. So the author, rahimahullah, he said, وَعَمَّا يَمْنَعُ وَصُولَ الْمَاءِ إِلَى الْبَشَرَةِ وَعَمَّا We said that the wow is atf, is connected to وَالنَّقَاءُ عَنِ الْحَيْذِ وَالنَّقَاءُ is connected to وَالنَّقَاءُ And we said that the word النَّقَاءُ means الخلو That you haven't got Anything that's preventing from the water to reaching you. If there is a ha'il, a object or something that's preventing from the water to reach the body, then this has taken away from it being called a wudu. In other words, the condition is missing. The shart of wudu is missing. So this is not considered wudu. And the author Rahimahullah mentioned. Which is the fifth. There should not be something which is on the limb that changes the water state, the state of the water. And again, that which can uh, change the state of the water is of course the color, the smell, the taste and the odor, whatever. It doesn't change the water. I mean, the water goes in your body. وَالْعِلْمُ بِفَرْضِيَّتِهِ The sixth is that the mutawaddi, the person who is doing wudu, he knows, he has knowledge of the obligation of this wudu. Number seven. أَلَّا يَعْتَقِدَ فَرْضًا مِنْ فُرُوضِ مِنْ فُرُوضِهِ سُنَّةً He cannot believe any of the obligatory acts in the wudu, he cannot believe any of them to be sunnah. The acts which he has to do in wudu, he has to believe all of them are fard wajib. And he's not allowed to believe any of them to be what? Sunnah. Number eight is al ma'u tahurun. That the water is pure that the person is using 
pure water. Number nine. Number nine is وَدُخُولِ الْوَقْتِ The time must enter. The, the time must enter. يعني if the person does wudu, but then the salah time didn't come in and the person lost their wudu, for example, then you didn't do wudu for the salah. وَدُخُولُ الْوَقْتِ The time has to enter. وَالْمُوَالَاتُ لِدَائِمِ الْحَدَثِ And the tenth is وَالْمُوَالَات Mualat means the uh, continuation. This is the, uh, the tenth and final. It is um, Continuity for a person who const- constantly remains in the state of impurity. So continuity for a person who constantly remains in the state of impurity. There are some people who have uh, impurity generally. They're always just impure. For example, a woman who has uh, istihaba. A woman has a continual bleeding. Um, the woman who has continual bleeding, she has to do wudu for every salah. Khalas. She's not allowed to um, do wudu from one prayer to another prayer. The same is the man or the woman who has Salis, which is the uh, continual urine, keeps coming from the person. These are the ten, inshallah ta'ala, that the author, rahimahullah, mentioned. Let's go through the ten, the evidences for each one. The first one is Islam. What's the evidence for Islam? The evidence that the scholars, the Shafi'iyah mentioned, is قوله تعالى the statement of Allah وَمَنْ يَبْتَغِ غَيْرَ الْإِسْلَامِ دِينًا فَلَنْ يُقْبَلَ مِنْهُ The Shafi'iyah they said that the wudu is a ibadah and the kafir ليس أهلا للعبادة the disbeliever is not fit for ibadah and his intention is not correct if he comes with it because you because he is not a Muslim. His intentions are not going to be right. And for him to do wudu, he has to be a Muslim. And if he does anything before Islam, Allah doesn't accept it. Allah only accepts what's done in Islam. And they brought the ayah, وَمَنْ يَبْتَغِ Anyone who looks for anything other than Islam, فَلَنْ يُقْبَلَ مِنْهُ It will not be accepted from him. So they said that the wudu he's looking to do without Islam, it will not be accepted from him. That's the evidence from the ayah. The second one is a tamizu. Tamiz means distinguishing. The tamiz is not bulugh. It's not reaching puberty. And the evidence that they used for Tamiz is the evidence for intention. Because they said Tamiz means he has the intention to do something. He knows what he wants to do. And they used the ayah, وَمَا أُمِرُوا إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ مُخْلِصِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ And also, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ The third was, the third was, the absence of menstruation and postnatal bleeding. Salah is not accepted from the woman who is on her menstruation. Salah is not accepted from her. She's prohibited from it. Based on the large number of ahadiths that have come from the Prophet ﷺ where he said, Da'is salah to leave the prayer 
ayama hayduki leave the salah the days of your menstruation and the wudu is a prerequisite for the salah so if the salah isn't allowed then the wudu isn't number 4 is وَعَمَّا يَمْنَعُ وُصُولَ الْمَاءِ إِلَى الْبَشَرَةِ That the water has to reach the entire body Then the evidence for that is the hadith I mentioned before Narrated by Bukhari and Muslim On the authority of our mother Aisha Where she said that the Prophet ﷺ will make sure That he would reach the water for the wudu on all of his body Number five. وَأَلَّا يَكُونَ عَلَى الْعُضْوِ مَا يُغَيِّرُ الْمَاءَ There shouldn't be anything on the limbs of the person that changes the water. And the evidence that they use is وَأَنزَلْنَا مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مَاءً طَهُورًا We send down from the sky pure water. So the person has to use pure water. Number six. Which is وَالْعِلْمُ بِفَرْضِيَّتِهِ That the person has to know and have the knowledge of his obligation. The evidence that the Shafi'iyah used is that if a person doesn't have the knowledge of it being obligatory, it affects his intention, they said. It affects his or her intention. And if it affects the intention, then it means that they did wudu without no intention. And if they do know, if they do wudu without no intention, then that act is null and void. It goes in against the hadith of the Prophet. Uh, the seventh is sunnatan. He should not believe any of the acts uh, of the wudu are sunnah. The evidence that they use for this is the intention. As I mentioned, the intention. For the previous one, which is al ilmu bi fardiyati, and the seventh one, which is wa alla ya'taqid farda min furudihi sunnatan. They use the hadith وَأَنزَلْنَا مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مَا أَنْطَهُورًا The ayah. Number nine, they use وَدُخُولِ الْوَقْتِ The time must enter. And then tenth one, the tenth one as well, they use the same evidence for it. And the evidence here that they used the Shafi'iyah is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He said, إِنَّ الصَّلَاةَ كَانَتْ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ كِتَابًا مَوْقُوتًا That the salah is at, is at an appointed time. يعني the wudu is not obligatory upon that person until the time enters of the salah. That's it. The time enters, that's when the obligation starts. Because that's the obligation of the wudu. And the qa'idah is مَا لَا يَتِمُ الْوَاجِبُ إِلَّا بِي now the salah has entered. The wudu wasn't obligatory on you before. You didn't have to do wudu. The time the salah enters, if you don't have wudu, you have to do it. It becomes obligatory for you to do it. It becomes obligatory for you to do it. Because the salah is at an appointed time. And the wudu is a prerequisite for it. And the tenth one is the same. Which is that the woman who's on her men's uh, uh, continue bleeding, she has continued bleeding, or a man who has a urine which is bowl which is salis, a continue, continue, continuity of urine, he also or she also has to do wudu just before the prayer. Because that's the time when the wudu is obligatory on them. Now we're going to go into nawaqid al wudu arba'ata ashiya. The things that nullify your wudu. We're now going to go into what nullifies 
a person's wudu. Number one, al kharij min ahad sabilain min qubul aw dubur rih ghairuhu aw ghairuhu illa al maniya. The things that nullify your wudu are what? Is al kharij min ahad sabilain. Anything that exits from either the front or the rear, the private parts, whether wind or anything except semen. Here you have to understand the point here that's been spoken about. What is being spoken about here is a person urinates, or they have, or they do call of nature. They do their their feces. Urine comes or feces. They break your wudu. Or wind comes from you. The wind for the men, it comes from the back. But the woman, the wind can come from the front and the back. Both of them, they break your wudu. For the women. If it comes from the front or if it comes from the back, it breaks the women's wudu. Here the question is, what comes out of the women and that which comes out of the men are two types. The things that come out of the human private part are two types. Something which is mu'tad and something which is ghayru mu'tad. Fuqaha mentioned this. Something which is mu'tad means it is normal for it to come out. Like urine. It's natural, it comes out. Also, a feces, which is natural, it comes out. But there are things that are which are not natural that come out. Like kidney stones that come out. And when they do come out, they're very painful for men. Kidney stones. A kidney stone is not something which is natural to come out. It's not every day that you have this. Does it also break your wudu? Or what breaks your wudu is any and, anything, any and everything that comes out. That which seems apparent is the things that break your wudu are what is mu'tad, the norms. And anything which is not mu'tad, which is not norms, doesn't break your wudu. The author here mentioned, he said, إِلَّا الْمَنِيَ except the semen. Except the semen means what? Someone's semen comes out after getting themselves into the state of purity. So a person went, they did wudu. They did wudu. And after they did wudu and they put themselves into the state of wudu, what happened is semen came out. Does this semen break their wudu, this many? And there's no other nullifier that follows it. There's no other, meaning they didn't sleep. Sleeping is another nullifier. No, it's not. It's a person who's sitting down, or he just, semen came out of him just by thinking. This is an exception according to the Shafi'iyah. Okay? What about if the money comes from the woman, but it's the money of the husband? It comes out later from her. The Ani, she showers, she cleans herself, and then the semen comes out later. She sees semen after. So she has sexual, sexual intercourse with her spouse, and then later, semen comes out from her. Shafi'iyah believe. This it will, it will break the wudu of the woman. There's no ghusl on her, but it breaks her wudu. Okay. The second thing that breaks your wudu is um, so first of all, what's the evidence that al kharij min ahad sabilaini urine feces, wind, and etc. that they break your wudu. The evidence for that is 
قوله تعالى أو جاء أحد منكم من الغائض أو جاء أحد منكم من الغائض This ayah is a nas, a clear text على أن الغائض ناقض للوضوء That's call of nature whether it be urine, ghaid is used for urine or inshallah is used for feces as well. It breaks all wudu. The second evidence for that is Hadith Abdullah ibn Zayd and Al-Bukhari and Muslim regarding the wind, which is لَيَنْصَرِفُ حَتَّى يَسْمَعَ صَوْتًا أَوْ يَجِدَ رِيحًا This again is a textual evidence that if you hear wind or if you smell wind, then you break, you broke your wudu. Also, Hadith of Safwan ibn Asan, and the Tirmidhi wa Nasai wa ibn Majah wa Ahmad, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, Walakin min ghaitin wa bawlin wa nawm, that urine and feces and sleeping break your wudu. Also, the woman who's on her istihada, her continued bleeding, the Hadith of Aisha in the Bukhari, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to the woman who was in a state of istihada, wa tawadda'i li kulli salah. Do wudu for every prayer. And then istihada is a naqidu lil wudu. Also, madhi breaks a wudu. Madhi breaks a wudu. Madhi, madhi, madhi. It breaks a wudu. And the evidence for that is the hadith of Ali ibn Abi Talib bin, I'm a hadith in Miqdad, sorry. And the Bukhari and Muslim. And the hadith is hadith Ali. Kuntu rajulan madha. I was a man, Ali ibn Abi Talib said, who used to have madhi. He said, I went to Miqdad and I spoke to him because I'm married to the Prophet's daughter. I can't go to the Prophet and ask him this question. And Ali said, I was a, a man who had a lot of madhi come from me. Madhi. And I couldn't go to the Prophet and ask him this question. So I sent his companion and I said to him, go and speak to the Prophet on my behalf. And he asked the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and the Prophet said to him, "Tawadda, do wudu, wagsil and wash the karak, wash your private part." This hadith also showed that the madhi is a what? The breaks so wudu. All of that is what comes from the private part, and they are all natural causes. Like in anything which is not natural that comes from the private part, that's not natural. This is not going to break your wudu. Okay? Number two, Zawalul Akli, being unconscious. The author explained what he means by that. He said, Binomin, by sleeping, or Gayrihi, or other than it. Illa except no maqa'idin mumakin. مَقْعَدَتَهُ مِنَ الْأَرْضِ The second one is زَوَالُ الْعَقْلِ The person, his aql goes. The aql of the person, it goes. And this can happen from sleeping. So the person when they sleep, they don't know. Their mind is gone. It breaks your wudu. And I mentioned the evidence for that. Or غَيْرِهِ When the author said, or oh, other than that, what enters here is other things that can make a person unconscious, which is not sleeping only. For example, al-junoon, insane. Igma, A person faints. As-sara, a person has um, jinn possession. Then the author Rahimullah gave an exception here. He said, Illa no maqa'idin mumakin. Except the individual who's sl- sitting down and he sleeps. And this person sitting is in a straight position. So this person is in a sitting position. Pay attention here. This person is sitting down. This doesn't break the wudu according to the Shafi'iyah. 
And this is a mas'ala that the scholars differed upon. Whether the sleeping breaks your wudu or not, when you're sitting. There's a discussion for it. We're not going to go into that details right now. So they divide the sleep into two. A sleep, a sleeping of a person who's lying down and the sleeping of a person who's sitting down. Again, the author, rahimahullah, mentioned the things that break the wudu. Number one is Al-Kharij min ahadi sabirayni min qubulin aw duburin rihun aw ghayruhu illa al-mani Anything that comes from the private part. Whether it be urine or feces. Or, or, or wind. Rihun, wind. And again, the wind that comes from the men is from the back passage and the women, it comes from the front passage and the back passage, they, it breaks their wudu. Illa al-maniya. The urine, sorry, the many. The many, what is it? The many is that which produces children, generally speaking. It's a semen. Children come from this. They say it's a fluid that comes from the man and it comes come from the woman. After it, it brings about fatigue. The person becomes tired and fatigued. And other descriptions they give for it. The many, the, sorry, the many, many, it is tahir. The many is tahir, by the way. There are evidence that is tahir. The, I'm going to mention two evidences. The first evidence is the hadith where the Prophet ﷺ mentioned the scrubbing of the many. He just mentioned to just scratch it off. And if it was impure, he would have told it to be washed. Because water would be needed to be washed. It has dried somewhere. The Prophet commanded it to be scratched off. Khalas. This shows that if it was impure, the Prophet would have commanded it to be washed. Number two is Allah wa Ta'ala honored the children of Adam. As Allah mentioned in the Quran, Walaqad Karramna Bani Adam. We have honored the children of Adam. If we are honored by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then what we are made of cannot be impure. Because we are from many. What we are made from cannot be something which is impure. Okay? And amongst the children of Adam are messengers and prophets. And so you saying that the essence of what mankind came from is impure? Is not right. The second which the author mentioned is Zawal al-Aqli, the mind of the person going. And we said the author mentioned two things. No or other than it. Sleeping and other than it. Other than it, here he means fainting, if a person becomes insane, and etc. Then the author rahimahullah, get, went back to the concept of sleeping and he gave an exception. He took out the type of sleeping it is. If the sleeping is sitting down, different discussion. That doesn't break your wudu according to the Shafi'iyah. Al-Thalithu, the third is iltiqa'u, iltiqa'u basharata, basharatay rajulin wa mra'atin. The meeting of the a man and a woman. A man touching a woman and then according to the Shafi'iyah if skin to skin contact happens between an adult men and women non mahram they are marriageable they can get married according to the Shafi'iyah without any barrier <coughs> they, break, they believe it breaks their wudu and the evidence that they use is Awla mastumun nisa. The Shafi'iyya take the word Awla mastumun nisa. Shafi'iyya belief, it's touching. And Al Imam Shafi'iyu said that. And Al Imam Shafi'iyu, he said Awla mastumun nisa in the ayah was in the context of 
um, the things that break your wudu. Allah says, وَإِن كُنْتُمْ مَرَضَ وَإِن كُنْتُمْ مَرْضَ أَوْ عَلَى سَفَرٍ أَوْ جَاءَ أَحَدٌ مِنْكُمْ مِنَ الْغَائِضِ If one of you comes from call of nature, he breaks your wudu, right? أَوْ لَا مَسْتُمُ النِّسَاءَ Or you touch a woman. And Al-Imam Shafi'i said, the word لَا مَسْتُمْ here means touching. The same way that it means in the ayah, وَأَنَّا لَمَسْنَا السَّمَاءَ فَوَجَدْنَاهَا مُلِئَتْ حَرَسًا شَدِيدًا أَوْ شُوبًا The jinns, what did they say? وَأَنَّا لَمَسْنَا السَّمَاءَ The jinns, they said, وَأَنَّا لَمَسْنَا السَّمَاءَ When we touch the sky. The word lamps was used by the angels here. And Al-Imam Shafi'i said here, angel did not have intercourse with the sama'a, of course. It means touching the sky. Um, Umar radiallahu anhu was also transmitted from him that he said, من حس من جس أو قبل فليتوضع Umar radiallahu anhu was transmitted from him that anyone who touches a woman or kisses her, he should do wudu. The fourth thing that breaks your wudu is مَسُّ قُبُلِ الْآدَمِيِّ أَوْ حَلَقَةِ دُبُوهِ بِبَطْنِ الرَّاحَةِ أَوْ بُطُونِ الْأَصَابِعِ The author, Rahimahullah, he mentions the other thing that breaks the wudu, which is the... Uh, Fourth thing that break your wudu. The fourth is touching. That's the first point. There's touching. Second one is so it's touching the private part of a human with the palm or inner surface of the fingers. The question here is. Is this talking about anyone who touches their private part or the private part of any other person? Shafi'i, as you can see here, they believe whether you touch your one or whether you touch another person's one, it's the same. And the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, which is used in this discussion is, من ذك من مس Anyone who touches his private part. Let him do wudu. So this hadith doesn't support the view of the Shafi'iyah here. It doesn't. It doesn't. But there's another riwayah that supports them that they mention. Which is, مَن مَسَّ ذَكَارًا فَلِتَوَضَّى Anyone who touches a private part, let him do wudu. And that's where they say, we are of the opinion that if you touch the private part of your own child, a mother touches her child's private part, it breaks her wudu. Shafi'iyah, they say, بِبَطْنِ الرَّاحَةِ if The inner palm. So if he touches it here, it's different. And they believe there's a difference between the inner and the outer. These are the four things that the Shafi'iyah believe they break your wudu. These are what? These are the four that the Shafi'iyya believe they break your wudu. The fourth and the last one was مَسُّ قُبُلِ الْآدَمِي أَوْ حَلَقَةِ دُبُرِهِ بِبَطْنِ الرَّاحَةِ أَوْ بُطُونِ الْأَصَابِعِ So inshallah ta'ala we will stop we will stop there inshallah ta'ala and we will take some of your questions, inshaAllah ta'ala. Anything which I have said that was wrong or incorrect is from me, shaitan, and Allah and His Messenger are free from it. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayhi.